So I thought you know, instead of a guided meditation, that we might do something different and, and see if we can experience poetry as a way of bringing us into uh, that sort of same space, that meditative space. And I thought we would just tonight um, pick the poetry of Rumi. Um, and uh, as I've said a few times, if you have a, headphones, it might help because I'm not sure how powerful the sound is my end. Um, but uh, I'm using recordings. I'll explain those at the end. But the way I'm going to do it is, is, is tell you a little bit about Rumi for those who might not know. Um, although he's probably the best-selling poet in the world, or his poetry is the best-selling in the world. So um, a lot of people know Rumi. Um, but, and we've used him very often in these sessions, particularly the, the poem, The Guest House, that Stan used it very recently in her guided meditation. And I just thought I'd say a few words about Rumi, but I want them to really allow his poetry to speak. And therefore, I don't want to say too much. Um, I'm using three poems. Uh, they're all about three, four minutes each. And I leave silent spaces between them. Uh, I'll introduce them, but leave silent spaces after each one. And in those spaces, what I'd like you to do is just to rest and really allow the words or the echo of the words and the poem to play themselves in your own, each of your minds. You know, don't try and interpret what he's saying. Allow him to reach you with his phrases, his words, his metaphors, his images. And, and just surrender to that. Just let that work itself on you um, and see what happens. Uh, whatever happens will be really important and, uh, you know, prayerful. Uh, so just honor that space. And, and if you don't like it and you go, that's also really important. So, so we'll expect nothing. We're not even going to try to meditate. We're going to let the poetry take us into that space. No, I'm still getting sounds coming through. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay, it's an ad. Um, okay, I had my, here it is. Okay. So when I use this image, it will be an image for being silent and just letting poems echo in our minds. So Rumi uh, was born in a part of Persia, which is now Afghanistan, um, in 1207, um, and he died in 1273. That's AD, just in case any of you are confused about that. And he Spent, he moved east uh, to a part of Iran that is, is now occupied by, um, what a part of Iran that is now Turkey. But at the time it was part of the Eastern Roman Empire and it was called Iconium. And that's where he lived and had his life and had his community and wrote his poetry. And Iconium in Iran at that time is now Konya in Turkey at the moment, and, and all of the, um, you know, his, his basilica or his um, mausoleum or whatever you call those things, they, uh, all the tributes are, are to, to, to Rumi are there. And I think that's a really dreary uh, depiction of Rumi, and I actually imagine him much more like this, because I think he was, he, he came into Iconium just as the whirling dervish movement was beginning. The whirling dervishes came from this time, um, as I say, it was Iconium, which is now Konya, and he was a, a very uh, enraptured poet and often just danced and then created poetry as he did, and his students and disciples uh, wrote them down. Now the thing about Rumi is he was never called Rumi. He wasn't called Rumi for until 200 years after his death. And Rumi simply means Roman. And as I said, this was, he was living in a part 
which was part of the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire at the time, Constantinople. But he, he, they called him the Roman because he lived in that part, but also to distinguish him from other Sufi poets or writers at the time. Um, he was Muslim, um, very devoutly so, um, part of the Sufi, the more mystical end of, of, of uh, Islam. But that's really important. That's sort of got lost at the moment, but in a way you could say his poetry has transcended his, his religious uh, tradition and it stands, it reaches people of every and no religion at the moment. Um, he, he, what else about him? Just he, he, they, in that community, they gathered every week. I think it was a Wednesday night for what they called a sama. And the word sama means listening, but it was, they would gather uh, for an evening of deep listening to poetry and jokes and prayer and stories. Um, the, the, those evenings had a, a going in feeling and, and they were an opportunity for people to open to the flow of the divine. And all of Rumi's poetry is really trying to open us to the flow of the divine. And the best image of that is indeed the whirling dervish. I'll come back to that in a moment. He said, the branches of your intelligence grow new leaves in the window of this listening, is Samar. At other times, they did all the same things that human beings do everywhere and have always done. They took walks, they reflected on things, they took deep care of animals whose body language they read like scripture. They gardened and they tended to vineyards, which was a very important, it was very critical to their, to their, you know, to keeping them going. Um, and in the evenings, they watched a lot of television. The point of Rumi's poetry is that he often refers to these ordinary things. And he says that he really believes that we can use anything we do as a lens to examine the growth of the soul. So everything is, is a grace, a gift. It isn't just these Wednesday evenings, but they're important because they attune us to listening. This is a poem about the ordinary things. A nightingale flies nearer the roses. A girl blushes. Pomegranates ripen. Halage will be executed. A man walks a mountain path, solitary and full of prayer. Trust grows for nine months, and then a new being appears. Narcissus at the edge. Creek water washing tree roots. God is giving a general introductory lecture. We hear and read it everywhere in the field, through the branches. We'll never finish studying. Neither of us has a penny. Yet we're walking the jeweler's bazaar, seriously considering making a purchase. Or shall I say this value with other metaphors? A barn crowded with souls. Quietness served around the table. Two people talk along a road that's paved with words.
God is giving a general introductory lecture. We hear it everywhere. We'll never finish studying. The nightingale flies nearer the roses. Trust grows for nine months. And then a new being appears. God is giving a general introductory lecture. mentioned the whirling dervish and in this extraordinary this is a movement meditation in the sanctuary we're planning to introduce it monday mornings uh, for everyone um but it's it's it can look a bit hectic but actually it's a meditation on stillness and emptiness um and every part of the dance is 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 reflecting a particular theology. So for example, if you look at the position of the right hand, it's pointing towards the heavens. And if you look at the left hand, it's pointing down towards the earth. So the, the essential part of this is a meditation on being a channel for divine grace, okay? And the central movement is sustained completely by the breath. So it's really a breath meditation. Uh, even though it's movement. There is movement. Uh, the interesting thing about the movement is that one of the legs, I think it's the left one, remains stationary and the other moves around. So even the, the symbol of that is, is it's, it's about finding that balance between stillness and activity in our lives. Um, and then the whirling is the kind of emptying it's the emptying of ego. It's, 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 it's creating that channel through which grace can flow. And mostly the music accompanying the whirling dervishes, it's, it's the music of the reed flute, which is that empty uh, instrument, you know, it's hollow. So empty of ego and full of grace is kind of the whirling dervish. And this theme is in the, 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 each of, of Rumi's poems, particularly the next two, okay? Oh, this is, you can see them here doing it. And you can see again, you know, the stillness, the, the, the legs, the one leg stationary, one leg moving. And again, very important, the left hand, right hand pointing up. And this goes on for a long time and it can go on at different speeds, but it's a pretty extraordinary. Let's listen to Rumi. Love has taken away my practices and filled me with poetry. I tried to keep quietly repeating, no strength but yours, but I couldn't. I had to clap 
and sing. I used to be respectable and chaste and stable. But who can stand in this strong wind and remember those things? A mountain keeps an echo deep inside itself. That's how I hold your voice. I am scrap wood thrown in your fire and quickly reduced to smoke. I saw you and became empty. This emptiness more beautiful than existence. It obliterates existence. And yet when it comes, existence thrives and creates more existence. The sky is blue. The world is a blind man squatting on the road. But whoever sees your emptiness sees beyond blue and beyond the blind man. A great soul hides like Muhammad or Jesus moving through a crowd in a city where no one knows him. To praise is to praise how one surrenders to the emptiness. To praise the sun is to praise your own eyes, praise the ocean. What we say, a little ship, so the sea journey goes on, and who knows where? Just to be held by the ocean is the best luck we could have. It's a total waking up. Why should we grieve that we've been sleeping? It doesn't matter how long we've been unconscious. We're groggy, but let the guilt go. Feel the motions of tenderness around you. We've been listening to uh, the voice of Coleman Barks, um, who, who translated Rumi's poetry, not from Farsi, which he doesn't speak, but from, you know, scholarly translations of Rumi. But it was Robert Bly who said to him, these poems need to be released from their cages. And for years, he just worked at rewriting them in a kind of a, you know, free verse, like the Walt Whitman style. And, his oldest friend is David Darling, who plays the cello. You heard him on the first poem. Um, but this is an album. They, this is next poem and the last poem I'm taking is from an album they recorded just last year. And Copeland is 83, 84. And since recording this, he had a pretty bad stroke. He's recovered, but he's alive. But I, I feel actually this might be, you know, the last recording he does. And, it has a different quality, um, but it's a poem I'd never heard of Rumi. I, I doubt any of you have heard this one. It, it's, it's, he hadn't recorded it before. 
and it uh, it's 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 a poem that tries to capture the quality of what happens when we practice what happens when we experience love when we have that experience in, in friendship in practice in our lives and he says when he says it, it's like a holiday without limits and this will be the last poem and we'll have some silence and then close holiday without limits going into battle we carry no shield playing in concert unaware of the beat or the melody we have become grains in the ground underfoot fold on fold layers of love nothing else obliterated as when the eye medicine is no longer even a powder then it can cure sight an accident gradually gets accepted as the thing that needed to happen sickness melts into health there is nothing worse than staying congealed let your liver dissolve to blood let your heart break into such tiny pieces it cannot be found the moon orb wanes then for three days you could say that there is no moon that is the moon that has drawn so close to the sun it is nowhere and everywhere send us someone who can sing music for the soul Though we know such longing cannot rise from a lute or a tambourine, not from the sun or Venus or any star. As day comes, Give back the night fantasy things you stole. Admit your arrogance as the stars do at dawn. When the sun goes down, Venus begins bragging, claiming light, arguing her loveliness over the moons. Jupiter lifts a gold coin from his bag. Mars shows the sharpness of his blade to Saturn. Mercury sits on a high seat and gives himself successive titles. That is how it goes. In the middle of the night, then dawn, Jupiter is suddenly poor. Mars and Saturn have no plans. Venus and the moon run away, broken and terrified. Then the sun within the sun enters. And this night and day talk 
seems a meaningless convention. The lighting business. A true holy day for a man or a woman is the one when they bring themselves as the sacrifice. When Shams shone his light from nowhere, I felt a holiday without limits again. was just a person. A true holy day. So maybe we'll draw this session to a close and I'll just leave you with one final quote of Rumi, which is all about your practices. Be loyal to your daily practice. He said, keep working and knocking on the door. And remember the door we're knocking on opens on the inside. Thank you, guys. Thank you.